for certified veterinary technicians in the state of Minnesota is one of our ways we are thanking you for all that you do for the veterinary profession each and every day. I'm Maria Nellison, certification coordinator for the MVMA, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for keeping cats comfortable, anesthetic and perioperative analgesic considerations in the feline patients with Siri Ray. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the Q&A area during the session. I would like to take a moment to introduce Siri. Siri graduated from the Medical Institute of Minnesota and became a certified veterinary technician in 2000. She has been with the University of Minnesota ever since. She obtained her veterinary technician specialty cert certification in anesthesia and analgesia in 2005 became a certified rehabilitation practitioner in 2013 and a veterinary pain practitioner in 2017. She lives with her husband, daughter, dog, cat, and pig in Egan, Minnesota. I'd like to uh, welcome Siri. Thank you, Maria. Can, there, can you hear me? All right, um, so I'm gonna Sounds be talking good. about <laughs> All right. I'm going to be talking about keeping cats comfortable um, and kind of go through some of the feline specific considerations in cats and then go through some of the um, more common comorbidities that we see in feline patients and um, kind of the specifics in addressing those. So, let me get. All right, so cats are not just small dogs. Um, they're small desert creatures um, that have different um, hemodynamics than the canine patient, and they tend to live solitary lives. You don't see as much um, communication in, from cats that you do with dogs in terms of body posture, um, verb vocalization, and things like that. And they also hold kind of a unique position in that they're both predator and prey. So they're really good at hiding a lot of their illnesses uh, like some of the prey animals do, but are prone to some of the complications that we see with the, um, with the carnivore animals. Um, so their doses and the duration of the medications are going to be different in the felines than they are in the dogs. So we can't necessarily just extrapolate from dog doses um, for our cats. They also tend to have a different temperament than dogs. Um, they don't spend as much time riding in the car or leaving their house in general. Um, so they're seen less frequently in the clinic. Um, people aren't quite as good as following up on regular um, annual checkups with their cats because it's difficult to get them into the clinic, drag them out of the house. And so we oftentimes have big gaps in their medical histories and only see them when something is um, going wrong. So they're a lot more likely to have undiagnosed comorbidities um, both because they aren't seen on a regular basis and also because they're good at hiding those diseases. They're also a lot smaller than most of our dogs, so they're going to be more prone to hypothermia and uh, fluid overload, one, because they have that desert-dwelling um, vasculature, so they aren't used to having as much fluid in their body, and also just because they have a smaller overall body size. Um, it can be a little bit harder to recognize pain in cats than it is in dogs. Um, they don't come to you uh, usually and let you know that something's wrong. They're more likely to become more withdrawn, you know, start hiding more, um, spend less time interacting. Um, you see them eat less often. And a lot of times people don't realize something's wrong until the cat's not using the litter box anymore. And that's when they realize that there's something um, painful going on. It also can be difficult to differentiate pain from fear in cats um, in a clinical setting because most of them aren't real excited about being in the hospital. Um, but there is the feline grimace scale, uh, which has been um, verified and is pretty useful um, in looking at cats, uh, kind of looks at their ear position, um, the shape of their eyes, uh, how relaxed their muzzle is, and the position of their whiskers and head relative to their shoulders. You can see over on the right hand side of the screen here, we've got the happy, comfortable cat all the way down to the cat that looks pretty um, painful and uncomfortable. Uh, so it's going to be important to minimize stress for the cats in the clinic um, to be able to establish an accurate baseline um, for the animal before we uh, do anything invasive to them to be able to compare our pre and post operative animal. Um, so if you can have a quiet cat exclusive space available um, 
have them come into the hospital in a different entrance than the dogs ideally, get them directly into an exam room um, so they aren't spending a lot of time getting worked up in the lobby. Um, minimizing restraint on the initial exam, um, you'll have a look at them in the carrier. How are they carrying their body? What do they look like? What does their face look like? And minimize stimulation. Um, you know, if you can listen to their heart while they're in the carrier before they get real worked up coming out, you're going to get a better sense of what their baseline heart rate is like. And um, you'll listen for any murmurs. Um, and have everything ready in advance. If this is an animal that you know you're going to be anesthetizing that day, have your drugs prepared as soon as the animal's getting checked in at the front desk. Um, you know, have your catheter supplies ready so the animal's not sitting there getting real worked up while you're getting everything together and running around in front of the kennel gathering these things up. Um, a lot of drugs work well um, through the oral transmucosal route in cats, and that can be really useful for the fearful and aggressive ones that are in the back of the kennel hissing. You can just squirt right into their mouth with your dexmedetomidine or uh, buprenorphine or even butorphanol and get some sedation that way without having to manhandle them. And if you've seen the animal um, previously and they're coming in for an appointment, um, send gabapentin home with the owners to administer that morning a couple hours before they come in. Uh, 50 milligrams for a smaller cat, 100 milligrams for a larger one, and they tend to be a lot more comfortable for the car ride and um, the initial exam in the clinic. Um, can also make a lot of environmental adaptations. Again, keeping the dogs and cats separated, um, having them in separate kennel areas, and then within the the cat's kennel itself, having a place to hide, you know, either a disposable cardboard box or something that's easily cleaned, um, and where it's going to be easy to extract the cat from it. Either the box lifts off of the cat or um, opens up wide enough that you don't have to reach in towards the cat's head. Again, have everything ready in advance, and um, you know, you can spray the kennel with feel away. There's um, diffusers that can be plugged into outlets in the kennel area uh, that help a lot and a lot of more information available on the fear free pets website um, with good ideas for things that you can do pretty inexpensively and easily in the clinic to make it a more comfortable ex experience for the cats uh, we have a couple of pain oops sorry a couple of pain scales um, that you can use to evaluate cats. The Colorado pain scale isn't verified, but it's used frequently because it's so easy. Um, and if you have the same person evaluating animals using it all the time, um, you can look for trends in the animal, at least comparing um, pre and post um, intervention uh, with analgesics or sedatives. Um, it's again looking at the animal. Um, you know how do they interact with people? How do they interact with their um, injured area? Um, what's their posture like? Um, what are they vocalizing? And this is something you can print out and post in the kennel area um, and to have as a visual cue while you're evaluating the animal to decide whether more analgesics are necessary. Uh, the Boducatu MCPS um, out of Brazil is a much longer involved pain scale, uh, more useful in um, research settings where you want to be very um, consistent in your evaluation, and that is verified in English and available through the website uh, listed there. Um, we'll start out with our pre-medication. Um, the goal is to keep the animal as pain-free as possible, ideally entirely pain-free. Um, we'll talk about full and partial mu agonists, um, alpha-2 agonists, benzodiazepines, dissociatives, and NSAIDs, which can all be used in the pre anesthetic period. So for full muse, um, morphine is kind of the standard for um, opioids that all the other ones are compared to in terms of um, strength and efficacy. Uh, a lot of people aren't comfortable using it in cats um, because they do tend to get pretty dysphoric on the doses that we use in canine patients, um, but respond real well and get good analgesia for four to six hours um, from 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, either through the sub Q or IM route. Uh, you do get histamine release with IV, um, so it's generally not bolus that way, but can be used as a constant rate infusion. Um, hydromorphone. Um, works for a shorter period of time, uh, two to three hours generally in cats, um, and can be administered IM or IV, less reliably sub-Q, though people do still use it that way, um, in a 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg dose um, with the IM route, or 0.02 to 0.1 mg per kg IV. 
Um, with hydromorphone, uh, particularly in combination with ketamine, uh, we often see hyperthermia in otherwise healthy young animals. So you're gonna wanna make sure if you are using that, that you're monitoring temperature pretty closely and intervening if they start to get hot. Uh, oxymorphone, unfortunately, isn't on the market right now, but is such a lovely drug in cats. I really hope that we see it back soon. Uh, you get four to six hours of analgesia with that. You don't see the hyperthermia that you do with the hydromorphone usually, although you can with any of the opioids. Um, can be used IM sub-Q or IV and um, produces really nice sedation and analgesia in cats. Um, Meperidine is another drug that um, is sorry is used less frequently in cats um, but is available uh, at a two to five mg per kg dose um, you see pretty profound sedation and good analgesia but it only lasts for about 90 minutes so this can be a real nice drug for something that is going to be uncomfortable during the procedure uh, but you're not anticipating a lot of pain afterwards um, and then methadone is going to have similar duration to morphine um, and can be used IM or IV in cats at a 0.2 to 0.7 mg per kg dose IM, uh, 0.1 to 0.3 IV. Uh, you don't see the histamine release with methadone that you do with the morphine and tend to see um, less dysphoria than you do with the morphine as well. It's more expensive, but when you're comparing cat size doses, you know, it's a difference of cents. Um, for partial agonists, we have butorphanol and buprenorphine. Um, butorphanol tends to last a lot longer in cats than it does in dogs. Um, recent studies have shown potentially up to three hours of analgesia um, with IM or IV administration in cats, um, as opposed to the 30 to 40 minutes that you may see in a dog. Um, 0.2 to 0.4 mg per kg IM or sub-Q, uh, 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg IV. Um, you don't get great analgesia with butorphanol, though, um, as a partial agonist, um, but it's nice for um, not terribly painful procedures, endoscopies, um, sedating for radiographs, things like that. The sedation does outlast the analgesia, though. And then buprenorphine um, has very good absorption oral transmucosally in cats, so this can be a really nice medication to send home um, for animals that have had particularly painful procedures. Um, you get six to eight hours of analgesia per dose, um, regardless of route. And it's not as good of an analgesic as you see with the full muse, um, but can be nice for that post-operative period. Has very high affinity for the receptors though. So if you do administer it and feel like it's inadequate, um, it's gonna be really hard to override with a more potent um, mu agonist. Um, like I said, with the opioids, uh, we sometimes see hyperthermia, especially with administration with ketamine in the healthy young animals. Um, if you do see that, um, treat them with ACE promazine to cause peripheral vasodilation um, to help bleed heat from the surface. Um, you can put an ice pack under their abdomen or in the kennel with them without blankets, blow fans on them, apply alcohol to their paw pads or ears if they'll tolerate it, and um, just let the evaporation with that help cool them off. If necessary, you can partially reverse them if you don't feel like you need the um, the analgesia on board anymore postoperatively. And you do see the dose-dependent dysphoria, particularly with morphine. Um, if you give a sedative in addition to the opioid, you're less likely to see that, and you can always partially reverse if they are dysphoric on recovery. Uh, Dexmedetomidine is the most common alpha-2 agonist that we use in cats. Um, from one to 10 micrograms per kilogram um, IM or similar absorption oral transbucosally. Uh, you do get decreased cardiac output uh, with this though, so I'm um, gonna wanna monitor um, blood pressure, saturations, um, particularly if they become very sedate and supplement oxygen if you aren't planning to intubate. Uh, causes peripheral vasoconstriction, so this is one where you're gonna wanna make sure you have your catheter stuff on hand before you give the drug so that as soon as they become sedate, uh, you can place your catheter before things get too tiny and start causing problems with uh, catheter placement. Uh, is completely reversible with IM um, adipamazole though. Uh, benzodiazepines don't produce very good sedation alone, but work really well with the opioids or um, the alpha-2s. 
in the healthy young animals, though, you can have counterproductive, um, go from an animal that's fairly awake to one that's climbing the walls if you aren't giving something in addition to it. Um, midazolam can be used IM or IV, can be mixed in the syringe with some of the other medications. Um, less expensive right now than the diazepam and has predictable IM absorption. Uh, diazepam is still in a lot of clinics, but has become a lot more expensive than the midazolam and can really only be administered reliably IV, so is um, not as favorable as the midazolam at this point. And then we have the dissociatives. Uh, ketamine uh, is in a lot of clinics, um, kitty magic cocktails where they're using a lot of times ketamine, uh, an alpha-2, and um, some sort of opioid, uh, usually either hydro or butorphanol. And um, ketamine does not work very well alone in, in cats without some other medications with it. Uh, you get muscle rigidity, and um, you know the Gumby cat where their limbs are just stiff and you can kind of pose them however you want. Um, so you wanna give it with a benzo and probably an opioid as well. And this can contribute to the hyperthermia in those uh, healthy young animals in conjunction with the opioid. Uh, it's fairly short acting, but can be used IM. And um, you're gonna to wanna to avoid that in your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cats or animals that are prone to seizures. Uh, Telazole has a dissociative and a benzo in it. It's a teletamine zolazepam combination uh, that's reconstituted, um, and that's essentially an IM induction dose, the one to three mg per kg. So you're going to want to have all your stuff ready to place catheter and intubate if you do use that as your premedication. Nonsteroidals. Um, Onsior or Rabanococcib is um, approved for use in cats, um, up to three doses on three consecutive days, uh, followed by three day washout, um, and then three more doses, uh, a total of three times. It's the only one in the US that's approved for um, multiple doses in cats. Um, overseas, Meloxicam is also approved for multi-dose multi and um, oftentimes is used off-label in the U.S. Um, for multiple doses as well. Uh, the question of whether or not to use it preoperatively is very clinic specific. Um, the jury is kind of out on that one still overall. Um, if an animal is normotensive, there's no harm in doing it beforehand. Um, if they are hypotensive though, um, the COX-2 receptors can be involved in renal perfusion to some degree, and you don't know if the animal is actually going to be hypotensive during. So a lot of clinics do prefer to wait till afterwards um, with the argument for before being that if you administer and have it on board um, before the inflammation takes place, you're gonna more effectively treat it. Um, so that's really gonna be up to the doctor in the end. Um, Alfaxalone is be, has become used a lot more frequently um, after recently becoming available in the 28-day multi-dose vial. It had just been a 24-hour drug previously. Um, this is a really nice drug to use for your fractious animals where you're concerned that they might have some cardiac disease and you want to do an IM induction um, but avoid uh, the catecholamine release that comes along with the sympathomimetic drugs like uh, ketamine and telazole. Um, so this can be administered two to six milligrams per kilogram IM or one to five milligrams per kilogram IV and lasts for about 25 minutes in cats. Um, you do have a dose dependent decrease in heart rate, cardiac output to some degree, um, mean arterial pressure and systemic vascular resistance similar to protocol or to propofol, uh, but it doesn't block the barrel receptors like propofol does. So the animal is able to compensate for um, a decrease in blood pressure by increasing its heart rate. Um, so it can be really nice in those cardiac patients. Um, if you use it without any other drugs, uh, it tends to produce a pretty rough recovery in cats um, and they can be pretty sound sensitive during recovery. You're gonna to wanna to put them into a quiet place. Uh, but if you combine it with a benzodiazepine, alpha-2 or an opioid, uh, it can produce really nice um, heavy sedation um, bordering on IM induction um, in those fractious animals. So here's a little cat uh, that was induced with um, 
with Alfaxalone. And this video isn't speeded up. This is him on recovery. So you can see you want to give something along with it to kind of smooth things out a little bit there. Um, for induction, after you've got your catheter in place, you've given your pre-meds, um, propofol is still pretty commonly used, pretty safe drug um, as far as most induction agents go. Uh, two to four mg per keg IV, um, more if you haven't given any pre-meds. Uh, the propofol 28 can, contains benzyl alcohol, um, which generally is contraindicated in cats, but um, they've been doing some studies using it in feline patients, and in Europe it's approved for um, single dose use in cats now. Um, in the U.S. it's still labeled for canine only. Um, so if you're going to be inducing an animal multiple times, um, say for bandage changes or something like that, um, probably definitely going to want to avoid the 28. Again, kind of a clinic by clinic call for um, for single dose use. Uh, ketamine and midazolam work pretty well together. You don't see as much um, respiratory depression or cardiac depression as you do with the propofol. Um, one to six mg per keg of the ketamine um, with 0.2 mg per keg of midazolam usually given prior to or at the same time as the ketamine. Um, or ketamine and propofol administered together, two mg per keg of each. Um, either the ketamine sandwiched between one mg per keg on either side with the propofol or administered at the same time. Um, or alfaxalone can also be used IV uh, as an induction drug or IM. Um, there's really no reason with all of the different medications that we have out here available to us now to ever do a mask or box induction. Um, the risk to the personnel involved, um, breathing in the waste gas, um, the stage two flopping and urination and defecation that the patient goes through. Um, it's not a pretty thing. It's not safe for anybody. And it's there's really no reason to have to do that anymore. Um, as far as intubation goes, cats are more prone to laryngeal spasm than dogs are. It's a good idea to put some lidocaine onto the arytenoids, either um, a couple drops from a syringe or if you have lidocaine spray, um, you can squirt that right on there. Uh, even if you have pretty smooth intubation, you can still see laryngeal spasm on extubation. So it's a good idea to get it on there on the way in so that you don't have to worry about it um, when you pull the tube at the end. Uh, V-gels are another option for feline intubation, which is actually a product that's designed to go into the esophagus, um, but then has a diaphragm that sits over the glottis and that the gas is administered through. Um, and then there's a little balloon that inflates um, to close off the esophagus so that um, all of the gas is going into the trachea. Um, it tends to work pretty well in animals where you're not using mechanical ventilation or repositioning a lot. Um, I'd be wary of it in dental procedures where you're putting a lot of fluid into the animal's mouth because you don't necessarily have a great seal um, if you're moving the head around a lot. But for animals that are going to be repeatedly intubated like radiation therapy, wound management, bandage changes, things like that, it can be a really useful tool uh, to minimize the trauma to the, to the trachea and the glottal area. And cats have small airways. If you're dealing with polyps or anything like that, and tidal CO2 can be a really useful tool to make sure that you are actually in the correct hole when you've um, intubated the patient and haven't accidentally intubated the um, esophagus instead of the trachea. As far as intraop management goes, um, just like any other species, it's going to be a good idea to have an ECG um, connected prior to induction if the animal tolerate it. Uh, you're going to see smaller, faster complexes uh, than dogs because you just have a smaller heart um, with not as much electricity flowing through it. Uh, Non-invasive blood pressure, sometimes the oscillometric units don't work as well on cats. Uh, Dopplers may be more reliable. Um, if you're planning to use an oscillometric, try to get a reading beforehand. Um, or before you induce, if you're having a difficult time getting good numbers when the animal is awake, um, you're not likely to believe the numbers that it gives you after they're induced. So you're going to be better off using a Doppler or an arterial line or something like that to give you more reliable blood pressure. 
Uh, your end tidal CO2 is oftentimes going to be a little bit lower than you would expect, um, especially if you're using a non rebreathing system. Um, just because the sample is going to be um, a mixed gas of the fresh gas that's coming into the patient as well as their expired gases, uh, just with the, how large the dead space is relative to their tidal volume. Um, there are trach tube adapters that you can get if you're monitoring end tidal CO2 that have the sampling port built right into the side so that you don't need to add all of the extra dead space of an elbow or um, some other adapter for your side stream monitors and these have a small diameter all the way through the entire um, trach tube adapter to minimize the amount of dead space which can be really useful in those little you know 0 0.8 0 0.9 kilogram kittens um, and you're also going to want to make sure you're monitoring temperature in cats um, due to their small body size they're going to be more prone to hypothermia and then on recovery more prone to hyperthermia um, if they're healthy, young, opioid and ketamine kind of cats. Uh, intraoperatively, um, remember that your inhalants aren't going to provide any analgesia, but contribute to the hypotension. So you're going to want to do what you can to minimize that. Uh, so running CRIs of opioids, alpha-2s, uh, ketamine, or even low doses of lidocaine, just remembering the cats are going to be more sensitive to the lidocaine than dogs are, um, probably 0.5 mg per kg. Um, dose of the lidocaine are all going to reduce your um, the amount of inhalant that you need. Um, doing local and regional blocks, you know, if you're working in the mouth, the dental blocks, ring blocks for, you know, uh, D claws if they're, you're doing those, or um, toe amputations for other reasons. Uh, rum block is going to get you anything distal to the elbow. Uh, epidurals are generally pretty easy to hit in cats. The anatomy is more is more easily palpated. Uh, you can do your sacral coccygeal blocks um, for the blocked cats or uh, PUs, things like that. And noceta, um, the liposomal encapsulated bupivacaine um, works really well in cats and is approved for use in them as well now too. Um, it's approved at uh, 5.3 mg per kg dose per forelimb. Um, their approval is in D-claws, but can be used off-label for other surgeries. And you'll notice that that's actually twice the dose, um, the 0.4 mils per kg um, that dogs are approved for. So you can use a larger volume in cats, which will get you better coverage, which can be important with that the small patient size, just the total volume relative to the incision size. But this gives you three days of um, good analgesia, which can be really nice um, when you don't have a lot of post-operative pain options for a cat. And if Noceta is not an option at your clinic, you know, line blocks with straight bupivacaine, again, just being aware of total dose relative to patient size um, or even lidocaine can be useful. Um, just like any other patient, you're going to want to maintain homeostasis, um, pre-warm the patients, wrap them in blankets so they aren't losing heat to, to room air, um, have them uh, use bear huggers, hot dogs, um, fluid therapy, your type rate are going to be dictated um, by comorbidities and your blood work, um, uh, pressors and inotropes, um, just like in the canine patients and um, maintaining balanced analgesia to minimize your amount of inhalant. Uh, cats are going to be prone to tracheal tears. They have a fairly thin mucous membrane in the trachea and because they're little they're easily manhandled and moved around so make sure that you're disconnecting from your machine before you move them. Um, also because you have such a small trach tube in, um, airway secretions are more likely to obstruct the trach tube entirely. So if you aren't monitoring capnography, make sure that you're bagging the patient from time to time just to feel how things are moving with air, watch the, um, the body wall movement, make sure that they aren't looking like they're working against something. Um, ideally, you'll have capnography on there so you can monitor uh, the waveform on that and make sure that it doesn't look like an obstructive pattern. Uh, like I said earlier, you can see laryngeal spasm at extubation as well, so make sure that your patient is breathing comfortably after you take the trach tube out. Um, if they do spasm, you may need to reinduce and apply lidocaine to the arytenoids. Um, 
They're going to be at an increased risk for fluid overload, so make sure that you're using a syringe pump or a fluid pump um, to make sure to administer your fluids, especially if you have a positional catheter where you know you move their leg and all of a sudden you're bolusing in a lot more fluids than you intended to. Uh, they're going to be more prone to barotrauma because of their small size, so having an appropriate size bag, having an alarm or a pressure relief valve or both on your breathing system so that if the pop-off valve is left closed, you're aware of it immediately, and they're going to get cold, so keep them wrapped as well as you can. You can see this cat in the picture here has a lot of air under their skin um, from a tracheal tear. Uh, Postoperatively, it's going to be difficult to recognize pain in cats. Um, dose on a schedule if you're not sure. Um, know what the um, duration of the medications that you're using is, and um, if you're having a hard time telling if the cat is painful, um, probably better to err on the side of caution and give them another dose of medication. Uh, make sure that they have an easily accessible litter box um, and litter in there that's not going to adhere to any incisions. Um, a quiet place to hide and a place to stay warm and also a place to move away from that heat if they need to as well in their kennel um, while they're in hospital. And consider what's going to be least stressful for the cat as far as post-operative pain control goes. If it's a really nervous animal, um, that oral transmucosal may work really well, you know, just squirting into their mouth, not having to handle them at all, uh, may be easier than pilling them. If they had full mouth extractions or something like that, it may be more comfortable for them to have subcutaneous or intramuscular pain management in clinic uh, than messing around with their mouth at all. So keep those things in mind um, when deciding on the post-operative um, pain management for the patient and, you know, make sure you're voicing your concerns to the doctor if it seems like their plan is maybe going to um, be more uncomfortable for the cat than some of the other options might be. So recognizing pain in these animals, um, here's a little cat uh, that just had um, a cardiac procedure done. Uh, she had a fentanyl CRI. Um, so she's still a little goofy waking up from her anesthetic. She was just extubated, but you can see her ears are forward, her eyes are round. Um, she's looking pretty comfortable, interactive, enjoying being petted. Um, I'm actually touching right next to her incision there, and she really doesn't care. The incision's on uh, her jugular vein there. Uh, this little cat had a radical mastectomy. Um, you can see the ears are flatter. Um, her eyes are a little squinchier. She's carrying her head lower, um, not quite as comfortable, but not horribly painful either, but you know, kind of takes interest when I start palpating back closer to the incision site. Uh, so this is a cat that we're gonna keep on fentanyl for a while afterwards um, to help keep her comfortable. So in hospital, if you were able to get that preoperative assessment before uh, the animal had anything done, you're gonna have a better idea um, to evaluate them post-operatively if you have that baseline behavior in your head. Um, again, keep them comfortable. Hypothermia hurts, so make sure you keep them as warm as you can. Place to hide, access to a litter box. Um, for pain control, opioids work really well. Gabapentin um, works pretty well in cats. Um, for analgesia and sedation and tramadol, while it's not particularly useful in dogs, actually works really well in cats if you have a large enough animal um, to be able to break the pill into an appropriate dose. Um, it doesn't taste good though, especially after it's been cut, so trying to get a second dose into them can be challenging if you're not putting it into a gel cap. Um, and then the NSAIDs can be really useful postoperatively. Um, if they have injuries, um, especially if it wasn't something you were able to fix, um, but you know you're managing with a splinter bandage, you know having those in place and comfortable and not pinching or twisting, uh, icing any incisions will help reduce inflammation and relieve pain. Um, and then when the cat goes home, um, it's important to work with the client to make sure that they're going to be able to keep the cat comfortable there too. Um, you know, talk to them, help them think through what was normal behavior beforehand. Is this usually a pretty interactive cat? Um, are they usually real busy moving around? Do they tend to lay around a lot? Um, how is their appetite? Do they eat? all their food at once usually, are they grazers? Um, you'll help them think about what their baseline is so they can compare that to what the cat's doing now when they get home uh, to be able to evaluate whether the pain management is adequate. Um, 
make sure that they've got the ac the litter box on the same level that the cat is going to be that it's going to be really easily accessible to them. Um, if they have some big fancy jump through the top kind of box, they may have to switch out for a low sided one for a little while uh, to make sure that the cat can get in there. Uh, they may need to make some adaptations with pet stairs or ramps. Um, so the cat can reach the spots that they like to be in the house. You know, if they're a windowsill sitter, it may be hard for them to jump up and, you know, probably not ideal for any post operative um, incision site either to have them jumping up on the windowsills. So, you know, giving them a way to get where they want to be without causing harm to themselves is going to be important. Um, and sending home pain control, making sure that the owner is comfortable administering that, um, that it's going to be administered through a route that the owner is able to do. Um, they know how to do splinter bandage care if that's on there and show them how to ice the patient as well. Um, you know, they can sit on the couch with the cat in their lap and get an ice pack on it. Um, as long as the cat's not struggling and hurting them or their owners, that can usually be very beneficial for at least the first 72 hours post-operatively. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the higher risk cases that we see frequently in cats. Um, there's a lot of cats walking around out there with some degree of renal disease. Um, they tend to tolerate it a lot better than dogs. So you see a lot more chronic renal disease in cats than you do um, in other species. And they come in, need their teeth cleaned or um, you know, can get hurt, have kind of a foreign body, something like that. So you're usually not seeing them for the renal disease, um, but it's still there when you have to anesthetize them for something else. Uh, so you're going to want to establish their iris stage um, with current lab work, um, including a urine-specific gravity, BUN, and creatinine, um, ideally all collected at the same time so that the urine-specific gravity is reflecting um, how well hydrated they were at the time that the other values were collected. And um, get them in hospital ahead of time if you can. Uh, they tend to be, you know, borderline dehydrated. So if you can do fluid therapy for 12 to 24 hours preoperatively um, at maintenance level, plus whatever deficit they have replaced over the first six to eight hours, uh, you're gonna have a much better chance of um, having a successful anesthetic without causing further renal damage. Um, they tend to run hypertensive uh, normally. So if you can get a resting blood pressure beforehand, um, if the animal is relatively calm, they'll give you an idea of what normal for them is. And then you can try to stay within about 20% of that while they're anesthetized. Uh, multimodal analgesia is going to be real important in these guys um, to minimize the amount of inhalant that you need that's going to decrease that renal blood flow. So um, opioids, Dexmed, and using lots of local and regional blocks if you can um, to minimize the amount of inhalant that you need. Um, your fluids are going to be dictated by the electrolytes on their blood work. Um, usually some um, isotonic fluid is going to be appropriate. Um, and you can use inotropes to maintain blood pressure within 20% of normal for that cat. Um, generally dopamine, um, but other pressors if necessary. And then use multimodal analgesics, um, local blocks, run CRIs uh, to minimize the amount of systemic drugs that you have in um, post-operatively so that you can have that cat up and eating and drinking normally as soon as possible post-operatively. And you'll want to keep them on fluids until they are um, having normal oral intake. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, is a problem in several species of cats, um, you know, particularly Maine Coons. You also see it sometimes in um, Persians and American Shorthairs, um, but particularly the Maine Coons, and it can develop as early as six months old. Um, I kind of operate on the assumption that any Maine Coon probably has it, and you can have severe disease and be subclinical um, and don't know that they had it until they, you know, suddenly drop dead. Um, if you have any concerns about it and the owner's willing to pursue an echocardiogram beforehand, that can be incredibly useful um, to kind of see what you're up against uh, as far as wall thickness and um, valvular placement and disease. Um, if they won't do an echo, at least get chest rads, try to evaluate the size of the heart and run an ECG um, and see if you're seeing any um, tachyarrhythmias uh, prior to induction. Uh, make sure that these cats are well hydrated beforehand because uh, they oftentimes aren't going to tolerate fluid boluses uh, intraoperatively. So you're going to want to make sure that um, that you're improving your odds as much as possible. 
Um, and then intraoperatively, you're going to want to minimize uh, your inhalant as much as you can, uh, but you're going to want to avoid uh, dissociatives uh, like ketamine that are going to increase uh, catecholamine release and um, thereby myocardial oxygen demand, uh, which is going to predispose them to those tachyarrhythmias. Um, optimize your perfusion. Um, so you want to try to balance your um, preload and afterload, um, being more concerned about decreases in preload than anything. Um, and then minimize your myocardial oxygen demand. Um, again, uh, being very, very cautious with anticholinergics or um, anything that's going to increase um, what that heart needs to do. Um, so avoiding your tachycardia, um, probably maintaining pressures more with um, inotropes than anything else. And then post-operatively, you know, listening to their lungs pretty carefully because uh, these guys are prone to left-sided heart failure. So you don't want to listen for that um, uh, increased lung sounds. Um, hyperthyroid cats, um, if we're seeing them for anything that's non-emergent, ideally they'll um, have had their T4 regulated pretty well uh, before coming into the clinic, but sometimes you do have an unregulated hyperthyroid animal that gets a fracture, a foreign body or something, and needs to be anesthetized before they've got that under control. Um, if you do know about it beforehand, um, having them well regulated and making sure that the owners give their thyroid medication that morning um, is going to make things a lot easier for you as the anesthetist. Uh, run an ECG uh, beforehand. If you hear any murmurs, um, get an echocardiogram if the owners are willing. Uh, again, this is an animal that's going to be prone to um, left-sided enlargement and um, cardiac hypertrophy. So, um, they're also going to have an increased metabolism of the drugs. Start out with your normal doses, but knowing that if you don't see the effects that you want, you may need to redose more frequently or go with higher doses. Um, one of the biggest problems with these guys is how unpredictable they are. Um, they tend to be pretty cachectic as well, so you're going to want to um, make sure that you're keeping them warm beforehand. Um, they tend to start out hyperthermic, but as soon as um, they become sedated, they get hypothermic pretty quickly. And you're going to want to minimize stress as much as you can, um, you know, having everything prepared in advance, not handling them any more than absolutely necessary to limit that sympathetic stimulation and avoid ketamine um, for sure in these animals. Um, intraoperatively, you're going to want to watch uh, for tachyarrhythmias on your ECG. Uh, maintain as close to normal as possible an end tidal CO2. Um, ventilation is usually really useful in these animals. Um, have adjustable CRIs so that um, you can adapt to whatever is this particular cat's going to throw at you um, and can get them back to normal as quickly as possible afterwards. You know, can dial them up if you need to if they're going to be one of the real ones that are just eating through the drugs real fast. And using your local and regional blocks um, whenever possible is going to help tremendously. Um, Postoperatively, um, listen to the lung sounds, um, make sure that their lungs are nice and quiet, that you aren't hearing an increase there. Um, minimize stress as much as possible. Um, in theory, you could see a thyroid storm up to 48 hours later. Um, it's not reported much in cats, but um, the potential is there. Um, so making sure that the owners are aware of um, you know, what that's gonna look like with uh, you know, tachyarrhythmias and um, you know, collapse and um, getting them home as soon as possible is going to minimize stress, but having them in clinic is going to make it easier to manage things like that. Uh, so a lot of it's going to be based on the patient's personality and how difficult it is to manage their pain afterwards. Uh, so the more you can do um, regional blocks or use long acting medications and stuff for analgesia without sedation, uh, the more likely these guys are going to be able to go home soon and get back to normal life. Uh, diabetes, we see um, a lot of type 2 diabetes in cats as opposed to the type 1 that you usually see in dogs. And so they're insulin dependent and usually very poorly regulated. Uh, it's hard to do glucose curves on cats in the hospital because they get stressed out. Um, but if you have a really good owner who's able to do it at home with a glucometer or a really well-behaved cat that can come into the clinic and let you do it um, without things going sideways, um, it's nice to have one within a week or two of their procedure. Um, 
usually uh, you want to fast the animal that morning, but give them a half half of their normal dose of insulin and then schedule this for the first case of the day so that um, they can get back to their normal schedule as quickly as possible. Uh, they tend to be hypotensive and they tend to be subclinically dehydrated. Um, so be aware of that and um, treat them appropriately with fluids uh, while they're under anesthesia. Uh, you want to use short acting drugs um, and use multimodal routes again. Um, to get them back awake and comfortable as quickly as possible post-operatively. Uh, check a glucose at the time of induction, and um, then about 30 minutes later, if things are going pretty smoothly, you can go out maybe as long as an hour before you recheck. Um, if their values are kind of bouncing around, you may want to recheck more frequently and treat them with dextrose um, CRI as needed to keep them as close to what is normal for that animal based on their most recent curve. Um, they're going to be less responsive to positive inotropes, and um, they're going to be more prone to um, cerebral um, ischemia because uh, they aren't going to be able to um, have normal cerebral vasodilation um, in their brains um, in response to CO2 levels. So you're going to want to make sure that you're ventilating these guys, keeping them um, to a normal end tidal CO2. Uh, Post-operatively, you want to keep watch monitoring the glucose until they're eating and drinking normally. So again, important to use your multimodal analgesics so that they can be alert and comfortable and get back to normal as soon as they can. So let's go through a case here and um, see if this all makes sense. So Charlie here is a three and a half year old uh, male neutered domestic short hair. Uh, that's blocked up seven times in the last three months. The owner is sick of having to unobstruct him and is ready to um, shorten his urethra a bit. So he's having a perineal urethrostomy. Uh, fortunately, she's pretty on the ball. She catches it as soon as he blocks up. And so he doesn't have any blood work abnormalities yet. Um, TPR is pretty normal and he's a little on the chunky side. Uh, so for pre-medication, based on that, um, we're going to want some analgesia and some sedation, but we don't need a lot. He's a fairly nice cat. Um, so 0.05 mg per kg of hydro and 5 mics per kg of dexmedetomidine and produce slight sedation with no resistance to handling. Um, he was induced with propofol after being pre-oxygenated, connected to an ECG, and um, having a baseline blood pressure. Um, lidocaine was placed on his arytenoids, and then he was intubated and maintained on isoflurane. Um, he had a uh, half a mg per kg uh, preservative free bupivacaine placed as a sacral coccygeal block um, to numb up the back end there. And then um, post or er, at the towards the end of surgery, uh, the surgeon infused um, 33 and a quarter milligrams of noceta um, into the surgical site, but not actually into the urethral mucosa. Um, and then post-operatively, he had um, oral robanococcib and oral transmucosal buprenorphine. And you can see him hanging out there in his little kitty cubby, um, relaxing, feeling pretty comfortable. And went home and never obstructed again. Um, to get deeper into any of these comorbidities, um, canine and feline anesthesia and coexisting disease is a really good book um, that kind of breaks it down um, comorbidity by comorbidity. And um, feline anesthesia and pain management is a really good book that just came out a couple years ago um, that has some great feline specific stuff um, for both acute and chronic pain. Uh, in feline patients, and the American Association of Feline Practitioners um, also have some great ideas for clinics and stuff to make um, canine or feline patients more comfortable in um, in your practice and less fearful. And then the American Association of Feline Practitioners has a nice guide that you can print out at this website that has a take home for clients uh, to kind of prepare them for what to expect um, in clinic for their cats to be anesthetized and talks about things like um, preoperative gabapentin and things if you want to use that. All right, I think we're ready to take questions. Thanks, Siri. Um, so we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one is at what temperature do you intervene with hyperthermia? It depends on how rapidly their temperature is increasing. 
Um, but usually I start getting interested around 102 degrees. Um, if they get up to 102.5 and it's taken them a while to get there, I'll maybe just keep an eye on it. If they're 102 and I temp them 15 minutes later and they're in 103, or even 102.5, 15 minutes after they were 102, I'll probably intervene at that point. Um, with the goal being to get them back down around 101, if you start getting them below that, they start to shiver if you cool them off too fast, and then that's going to kick their temperature up again. So that's kind of counterproductive. So you just want to cool them off to the high end of normal again. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, can using injectable on sewer help to combat the hyperthermia? Let me think about that. Um, I don't think that would work because the hyperthermia is coming from microfasciculations in the muscles. Um, so uh, using an anti-inflammatory wouldn't really affect that. You would need to do something uh, that would cause muscle relaxation or vasodilation to combat that. Okay. And so Ansior probably wouldn't be the best choice for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question, we use uh, a buprenorphine dextomator ketamine cocktail to sedate our cats and often post-operatively their temperatures tend to spike two to three hours post-op. Is this likely due to the ketamine use? Yes, the, the ketamine and buprenorphine combined, any of the opioids combined with the ketamine, you can see that. Um, so swapping out the opioid wouldn't necessarily help, but that's um, probably primarily related to the ketamine. Okay. And, and what are your go-to post-op meds for declaws? Um, we actually don't do a lot of routine declaws, um, but using if you are doing them in clinic, um, if you can talk the doctor and the clients into using Noceta, that's going to be tremendous for that. Um, if they aren't interested in using the Noceta, um, at least doing a ring block uh, with bupivacaine to get you six to eight hours of analgesia is going to be a good start. And then getting the Onsior on board um, as soon as possible after that um, to minimize the inflammation that's, that's going on at the surgical site um, is going to be important. Um, gabapentin can be really useful for that too, because that's going to catch your neurological pain um, that's going to go along with the, the nerves that are cut um, with the declaw and um, also help keep the animal calm afterwards so they aren't walking around on it too much. Okay. What is your go-to sedation protocol for an oral surgery on a healthy cat? Um, temperament is going to come into play there. Um, assuming normal blood work and, and if it's an oral surgery that can be blocked um, pretty reliably with uh, dental blocks, um, then if, if it's a wild child, um, probably a hydrodex med I am. Um, if they're a really wild child, um, hydrodex med uh, adipamazole, or sorry, um, alfaxalone. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of ketamine in the healthy young animals just because I'm lazy and don't want to have to deal with the hypothermia or the hyperthermia postoperatively. Okay. What are your feelings on using propercane for intubating cats instead of lidocaine? I think that's fine. You know, as long as you're getting some sort of uh, local onto the sites uh, to minimize the risk of the laryngeal spasm. Okay. How do and you that's going to have good OTM absor or um, mucosal absorption as well. Okay. How do you help an owner differentiate between anorexia associated with coming off of an off of anesthesia versus pain? Uh, that's a good question. Um, find knowing in advance what a favorite food is is going to be really useful, and potentially sending home something like Entice that's going to be an appetite stimulant will help override um, the anesthesia-associated anorexia. Um, which, if you're using really good balanced anesthesia, you may not see, um, you know, or using Serenia. Um, as well in your perioperative period will help with that and making sure you're not sending home a nauseous animal 
is going to help minimize that. Um, but you know, if they're interested in the food but don't want to pick it up and they had some sort of oral procedure, um, that would lead me to think pain. Um, if they're just not interested at all, um, when you bring the food to them, that's probably more likely nausea. So I guess taking my long answer and shrinking it down, uh, bringing something delightful to the animal if they still don't want it um, is probably more likely nausea. Um, if you're expecting them to go get it and um, the pain associated with their procedure is going to interfere with um, ambulation or something, uh, then it's going to be harder to tease out. So make sure that they have easy access to something they enjoy. Okay. And, and watch for drooling and things. You know, drooling is going to be nausea from the anesthesia more than pain from um, the procedure. All right. Uh, do you recommend IV fluids for all surgeries in cats? I do. I think it's a good idea to have venous access in any animal that's under anesthesia because you can always have surprises and you don't want to have to try to get that vein after the animal's already arrested. And um, you need to keep that catheter patent while you're doing it. You're going to have some vasodilation um, associated with any inhalant anesthetic, and you're going to have um, losses through the airway with the compressed gases that you're blowing across that. You fasted the animal, so they're probably going to be subclinically dehydrated um, from not drinking that morning because they're nervous and they're in the clinic and everything. Um, so I think it's a good idea to do you know, low-dose fluids, um, in pretty much everything, the um, AHA recommendations for cats um, right now is uh, three mils per kilo per hour, and that's you know pretty close to maintenance fluid rate, um, which seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do for something that's not drinking. Okay, uh, the next question I'm going to try combining it here. Uh, it's about CRIs. Um, what CRI do you recommend for a hyperthyroid cat, or do you use a CRI for every feline patient? Um, I don't necessarily do a CRI for every feline patient, especially if I can good, get a good regional block. Um, but fentanyl can be incredibly useful in those hyperthyroid cats because you can dial it up and down. You're going to get good analgesia. You're going to have good max sparing, um, and you're going to get some sedation on the tail end, but not a lot. So you can get them back to normal pretty quickly. Um, as long as you know that you're gonna need to have something else to take over the analgesia post-operatively um, if you are using fentanyl, because that's not gonna last long into the post-operative period after you discontinue it. But that's one that you can dial down and leave them hooked up for a while post-op too until they're a little more up and about. Okay. What are your thoughts about using Onsur before and after surgery and anesthesia, surgery slash anesthesia? Well, it's a COX-2 selective um, NSAID, so you're not going to see, a, you're not going to run as much risk of um, renal injury if you do have a hypotensive event, but you do still run some risk of that. Uh, so anytime you're using a non-steroidal preoperatively, you're kind of going on the assumption that you're going to have a normal tensive patient. Um, but it is nice to have that analgesia beforehand um, and, and the anti-inflammatory on board beforehand. So it's kind of a hard call. If it's an animal that you really don't think is going to be hypotensive, I really don't see any harm in doing it beforehand until you get bit with the one that um, that surprises you, and then you probably won't do it for a while. <laughs> okay. Do you lubricate endotracheal tubes when intubating? Yes. Um, there was actually a very clever study someone did about eight years ago where they took trach tubes and um, stuck them into test tubes and lubed some and didn't lube, lube other ones and then poured a dye down next to it. And the lube tubes required significantly less air in the cuff uh, than the unlubed tubes. And the tubes that were lubed with the cuff inflated beforehand had much better um, seal as well. And with cats, you know, where you're worried about uh, tracheal trauma and you know, the potential for an ischemic injury if you overinflate the cuff um, and tracheal tears with reposition and stuff. If you can get a good seal with a lower cuff pressure, I think that's important. Okay. Do you use Simbidol? I have not had a lot of experience with it. 
Um, I'm a little twitchy about the idea of anything that lasts that long um, because uh, buprenorphine has such high affinity to the receptors uh, that if you end up having an animal that um, has an adverse response to it, it's going to be really hard to reverse that. You're probably going to end up hospitalizing them for a little while until the drug is gone. Um, if you have an animal that is absolutely bananas and the owners are going to have a hard time dosing them with anything at home, though, uh, it's probably worth the risk. Okay. The next question is, do you, uh, you know, I want to combine this one as well. Do you give Serenia as part of your protocol? Um, and another technician said it, it always cuts down on not eating or nausea. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, I think Serenia is great. Um, if you're using a protocol that um, you think is likely to make the animal nauseous and, you know, your alpha 2s make cats nauseous, your opioids make cats nauseous, um, I think it can be incredibly useful, especially if you, you don't give it on the front end of thing. And nausea is uncomfortable. And if they're having an intra-abdominal procedure, um, you know, where they're going to have an abdominal incision afterwards or something, um, that's going to help keep them more comfortable. And it may help with visceral pain as well. Um, so, okay. yeah, I think it's great. Okay. Uh, what is an example of a thyroid storm? Uh, so thyroid storms are something that's mostly reported in humans, but they, there's the potential in animal patients as well. Um, where what you're seeing is tachyarrhythmias with um, profound hypertension. Uh, it's basically like a huge catecholamine release. Um, so you're getting a huge release of the thyroid hormones um, and they just build up and up. Um, so it would be mostly the tachyarrhythmias and hypertension, hyperthermia, um, and then progresses to congestive heart failure and cardiac arrest um, in humans. So again, not something common, but you know the potential is there. And so what you would do, warn, warn the owners about is the animal starts to feel hot and their heart's racing. Um, you'll get them into the clinic. And then that's something that, you know, in hospital, you can treat with um, methimazole and, um, you know, if you're in that situation, also also in, uh, potassium iodate, but um, hopefully not getting to that point at all by minimizing stress. Okay. And last question, I think, I'll double check, but uh, do you use Kitty Magic and how often and any specific I cases you use it on? I don't actually use Kitty Magic. I prefer to tailor um, the protocol to each individual patient based on temperament, um, how painful the procedure is going to be, and how long the procedure is going to take, and then any other comorbidities that the, the animal has. Okay, I had two more questions pop up <laughs> real quick. Um, any recommendations for intubating cats that have long, soft palates? Um, Pre-oxygenate, so you get some extra time to get in there. Um, have your induction agent um, on hand so you can continue to titrate as long as you need to. Um, if you do have V-gels, those are great for those guys because that just lifts it out of the way and makes it a non-issue. Um, otherwise, you know, using the tip of your trach tube to lift the epiglottis out of the, or the um, soft pellet up out of the way like you would with a pug or French bulldog and um, making sure that you have capnography on hand so that if it isn't the easiest um, visualization when you're placed in the tube to be able to hook that up and make sure you're in the right place or listen to the chest when you bag and make sure you're hearing lung sounds. Okay, and last question. What are your thoughts on when owners should feed pets after surgery? Our go home instructions say to feed the next day and other doctors have said to feed half their amount of food that night. Um, I think feeding half of the food that night, um, a lot of times, you know, offering a small meal in clinic, um, as soon as they're up and about, you know, not, not a meal meal, but, you know, a little bit of chicken baby food or a couple pieces of kibble or something, uh, just to stimulate GI motility again, um, and 
give you the opportunity to check for nausea and address that before they go home is good. Uh, you are going to have some decreased GI motility and, you know, any animal that undergoes anesthesia. So you don't want to feed a full meal. Um, but getting them back to eating and drinking normally um, as soon as you can is important. So I, I, I'm a big fan of a half meal that evening. All right, let me just double check and make sure there's nothing else. I think that was it. Wonderful. Well, great. Um, I just would like to thank this opportunity to thank Siri for her time and informative presentation. The MVMA will be emailing you a link to the evaluation and would greatly appreciate it if you could uh, take a few minutes to fill it out. We do analyze the evaluations to help improve future CE offerings. Um, also, you will receive your CE certificate at that time as well. Um, we should have this presentation available on our YouTube channel, which we can email you the link once that becomes available. Um, the latest probably it should be sometime next week. Um, if you do have any other questions, um, please email me uh, at Maria N at MVMA.org. Again, thank you so much, Siri. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Siri. Great job. Thanks.